Well, I um, have the um, opportunity this morning to talk about one of the um, subjects that um, is near and dear to my heart. Um, you know, I teach bell choir here and um, have studied music quite a bit in my life and had the opportunity of playing several instruments and learning um, together and realized the incredible power that music has in our lives and um, what it can do for us spiritually. Uh, God created it and we have this incredible um, gift from God that we can use for our encouragement, for our growth spiritually and which the devil also has taken every gift that God has given us and has turned it into a tool for his use. Is that true or not? I mean, if you think about every, every gift that God gives us, he gives us marriage. Has the devil turned around and turned that into ways of destruction for many, many people through unwise, hasty, or premature marriages? Um, it is something that uh, we all find. Food is the same way. God created it as a gift, and uh, it has been turned into so many ways, avenues of uh, the tools of the devil in our lives. I mean, everywhere you go, in every building practically you go into, and wherever you walk around, you listen you, or see, you see people that are inundated with music. In fact, the statistics are that music is consuming as much as, this was astounding to me, the, the, the research that came out in 2017, I believe it was, 18, last year, 2018, that music consumption by Americans that are ages 13 or older has increased from the previous year of, and I have the statistics there, but the current statistic is 32 hours a week of consumption of music. And just one year prior to that, it was around 23 hours. That the amount of consumption of music in our life had increased eight hours in one year. And if you went back to 2000, the year before that, 2015, 16, 17, I think they were, is when the research was, you increased, um, it was like six hours over the previous year. And that was by the Nielsen Research Group. We are surrounded by music in every way, shape, or form, and uh, it, is, it is like um, ubiquitous in our lives. Everywhere we go, we are faced with it. And it is something that you and I, I mean, we can't, uh, we, we can't get away from, practically. And there has never been perhaps a generation in history, except the last two or three or so, that has ever been able to be surrounded by music in so much. I mean, if you wanted to have music before, you had to go somewhere and listen to it. You had to open your mouth and sing. <laughs> but now for the first time in history, we have, a, um, we have the opportunity of hearing it and listening to it everywhere, all the time, and anywhere. The ubiquitous iTunes is everywhere. It's on our apps, it's on our phones, it's on our computers, and um, it's in our heads. <laughs> you, we find it everywhere. Teenagers today, and when it in 2015, Common Sense uh, Media released a, 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 a census um, of teen teenage use, and the, it was a study that aimed specifically at teenagers that um, between the ages of 13 and 18 that account for eight and a half, almost nine hours of entertainment media use every day. Eight and a half hours. How long do you sleep? Okay, we're, it's declining, but eight hours. So it only leaves eight hours to do something else. <laughs> In other words, almost all available time outside of regular life is consumed with media. And here's those statistics. 32 hours. This is adults ages 13 and older. Um, 32 hours. This is year 2017 that are spent per week listening to music. 26 in 2016 and 23 just three, uh, two year, uh, three years earlier in 2015. Is this a huge increase? In just a few hour, a few years, this is enormous, really. By statistics, this percentage is a huge increase. And I don't know if that's sustainable. I don't know if you can continue to grow that fast. But it shows the incredible, uh, blooming impact that music is having more so now than ever before in history. 
our musical tastes peak. Listen to this is a study that came out in uh, 2018, actually the latter part of 2017. Our musical tastes peak as teens, uh, as teens. Look at this chart. This is music for a lifetime. When, a, when, is, when do the strongest musical adult preferences set in? For women, it is age 13, and for men, it hit just a little bit later at age 14. So, this is like if you ask adults, what is your favorite song, and what is your favorite style of music? And they had to identify where it came from, when they chose it, and they looked at it, and it was on what Spotify data analysis that they put together and found out that indeed, it, the, the peak preference of when we form our musical preference and tastes, for ladies come at 13 and for men at 14, those years that are so critical, these teen, teen years that are so pervaded with music and media. Now, um, the music we are told is the idol which many profess Sabbath keepers Christian worship. Um, Satan has no objection to music if he can make it a channel through which to gain access to the minds of youth. You know, I think it's no mistake, and we have to awake to the reality, if we aren't, that music is an avenue by which the devil is gaining access to the minds of youth. We are told that's the case. And this is what we are facing in a society that is pervaded more so than ever before by music, by entertainment, and by media. And it goes on to say uh, this, when turned to good account, music is a blessing, but it is often made one of Satan's what? Most attractive. Now, what is the word most? Superlative. Is there any other? <laughs> well, it's one of the most, so there might be other mosts. <laughs> but it's one of the most attractive agencies that Satan has to ensnare souls. So when we look at the world around us, we have to recognize that there is music that the devil is using. Good or bad, how do we judge and how do we know? Because it is a reality that it is happening and chances are it is happening to me. Because the devil has his marks. We are told specifically, uh, I didn't put the quote up there, but um, in one statement we are told that Spirit of Prophecy says, many people associate themselves with Battle Creek because they think that they're gonna be safer there, they're gonna have an easier life there. And that might be the case. Many people would be, a, would be wanting to come to Washita Hills because they think it might be an easier life. But we, we are told that wherever Satan, wherever God's people are, there's a chance that they might become productive workers for Christ where God is doing something for the salvation of souls. That is where Satan puts his special attack. Which means to me that at a place like this, if we are doing anything right for God and we're trying to train young people to become workers for him, what is the devil gonna do? He's going to aim here harder than maybe anywhere else. And he could do it through different avenues, but if this is one of the most alluring, he's probably going to try to do it even that way in our lives here. And now some other uh, similar uh, statement. This is a few pages earlier to the 506 page. Uh, 479, the same first um, volume of the testimonies, we are told the introduction of music into their homes instead of inciting holiness and spirituality has been a means of what? Diverting the minds. So here we have music that is in the home. And I would suggest at the time, this was not music. If we heard this music today, we would think, oh, that's, <laughs> that's nice music. <laughs> it's good music, probably. Uh, because it, it's talked about instrumental music, frivolous songs, a popular sheet music of the day, which is probably nothing compared to what we have today. But she says it's congenial to their taste. In other words, young people like it, therefore they do it. But notice what happens. We are told that it... The instruments of the music have taken time which, have been, which should have been devoted to prayer. Music, when not abused, is a great blessing, but when put to a wrong use, it's a terrible curse. So can you all agree with me today that music has this, incre this incredible capacity for benefit or this incredible capacity for destruction? you agree with me? Is that clear? And we have to say that that's the reality which we live in. Music is incredibly good or it can be incredibly bad. And why? It goes on to say in the same paragraph that it, it, the music, that is, excites. It's exciting. <laughs> and if there's ever more time that music is exciting, it's probably in our generation. Is that true? In, in, in any previous generation, you would have to look at it and say, well, you know, when most people listening to the music of bygone centuries, 
Young people, it's boring. It doesn't have the, 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 the beat and the drive and all the exciting components that the music has today. It excites, but it does not impart that strength and courage which the Christian can find what? Only at the throne of grace. Now, that means that we need something that can only come from this thing and spending time in it. And music can divert us from this, even good music, and what happens? It might excite, and, and I remember when Chad Cruiser was here, I might talk, we'll talk a little bit more, we're gonna continue, I'm not gonna go too long this morning, we're gonna continue some more tonight on it, but um, when Chad Cruiser was here, I, you all, some of you here last week, and I remember him talk, last year rather, and he was talking about how um, he, when he was growing up, there was a song that he, that he, was, that he loved, it was about Amanda, do you remember that? <laughs> And how he and his friend, uh, uh, Scott Ritzman, actually, they kind of knew each other. And they all, they just fell in love with this song with uh, Amanda. And it felt like they were in love with Amanda through this song. Do you remember that? <laughs> and what the music did for him, it gave him a false sense of reality that he was actually in love with something that he wasn't in, really in love with. Because <laughs> he didn't even know Amanda. <laughs> except through the song, right? And, uh, and I think that the music, it does that. It excites and imparts us something that we think is a, it's a virtual experience. And he related, Chad Cruiser related that to contemporary Christian music in which people might hear and sense and feel that they have a relationship with Jesus. Because when they're singing, they're excited and they're worshiping, and there's all this going on and they are, ah, this is it. I've got a relationship with Jesus. And they go away and it was a virtual relationship and they didn't find it where it comes only from the th spending time with Jesus in his word at the throne of grace. And that could be one of the problems of music is that it's not a bad thing, but even good music, can you agree that even good music could be a bad thing if it does this? Even good music, maybe even godly music could be. And so uh, only in the throne of grace. And then it says where we would make known his wants and his and strong cries and tears, pleading for heavenly strength to be fortified against the powerful temptations of the evil one. Speaking of, of music. And then Satan is leading the young captive. Oh, what can I say to break his power of infatuation? He's skillful charmer. Luring them into perdition, I saw that Satan had blinded the minds of the youth that they could not comprehend the truths of God's word. Their sensibilities were so blunted that they regarded not the injunctions of the holy apostle. And then it goes on to quote scripture. In other words, that, that music was replacing the real thing in the lives of these young people that were Sabbath keepers way back then. And we are told, she uh, elsewhere says, that right before the close of probation, a similar thing is gonna come in, but it's gonna be more pronounced more strong in our generation today. Education, music is often perverted to serve evil purposes and thus it's become one of the most alluring agencies, similar quote, um, of agencies of temptation. Most alluring, most captivating, the, the, the highest, just, can you agree that this, this is a big issue in our lives, in our culture, in our society, in my life? It can be and it probably is. This book came out 2017, The Hacking of the American Mind, The Science Behind the Corporate Takeover of Our Bodies and Brains. Robert Lustig, he is a professor of pediatrics focused on neuroendocrinology. He's studying the brain of children at uh, University of California at uh, University of California at um, San, San Francisco, I think it was, and the previous one, Southern California, University of Southern California. And um, he, uh, he was studying, he's studying the brain. And he just recently in a, in a, uh, a talk that he gave um, said this um, statement. He said, for example, you may, uh, actually, I'm gonna have to back up. He said this, for, uh, um, it's not a drug. Speaking of media consumption and music consumption, he said it's not a drug, but it might as well, it might as well be, for it works the same way and it has the same result. Speaking of media and music, that it has the same result as a drug, and it might as well be when he's looking at this. And when he, um, he was studying the difference between pleasure and what he calls happiness. I wish I had time 
Maybe some other time we will see one of his clip of his presentation or one of his talks. Fascinating talk that explains the science behind what is happening in our generation today when we are consumed with media and what media does and why it acts like a drug. Now, you remember she said it, it excites, but it doesn't impart this noble uh, aspect of Christian living that the Bible would give us if we spent time in God's word. That's what media and music does. And it, 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 things that are addictive, they excite the brain cells. And the brain cells, when they get excited through dopamine, they will eventually die through the overstimulation of the dopamine. And so the brain cells, he was explaining this, the brain cells, in order to prevent dying off, they start snipping the receptors that they have. Because if they get too, men, too much of that stuff, they're going to die. And in a self-defense mechanism, they start cutting off those receptors. And that's why you start to have to have more and more of it to get the same kick. Does that make sense? Do y'all follow that? And things that fire dopamine are those things that are addictive, whereas serotonin is, he says, suggested a different, that's the happiness one that is not found in these methods. They are found in, in, in other pleasures, but it's a different neurochemical in the brain, and it's not addictive. And he was explaining how in our society we are finding that the media consumption is not it is addicting, and we are addicted to it. It was suggested this, and just in summary, um, he said, for example, you may think that you have free will, will to choose the food you eat. He wrote another book on food and sugar and its addiction. And uh, he said, the entertainment you consume, you're free to choose it, and you're free to choose the beliefs you uphold. But there's a bigger story behind the scenes, and this story has to, a lot to do with a battle between pleasure and happiness. And pleasure is what sells. And the music industry, and the uh, movie industry, and Amazon, and uh, the other Netflix, all the, 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 the media that we are consuming online knows that, and we are becoming addicted to it. It is a scary phenomena that you and I are engaged right in the middle of. But music at the same time, while it has this incredible power or danger, we are told rightly employed is a precious gift designed to uplift the thoughts to high and noble themes and to inspire and elevate the soul. So you and I are in this battle between Christ and Satan and they're playing a game of life over our souls. It is a real battle that you are and I are, are in the middle of. It is a great controversy. And, and we're here and we have to deal with the reality of the experience that we find ourselves in. At the end of time, when all the end time events are gonna happen, we are told that all the world is gonna wander after the beast. Is that true? How much of the world is gonna do it? Well, almost all, right? Is God gonna have still a few people? <laughs> There is going to be a group of people, a group of youth, rightly trained, that are going to stand against the attacks of the enemy at the end of time. And it's going to happen. We are told that's much of two. But from all outward appearances, it would seem that all the world is surrounded and is following the, the image, uh, image and following the beast and his image, we are told. And it stands to reason, as I look at my life and as I look at the world and I say, oh, listen, the amount of music consumption that is going up, media consumption is going up, and they are controlling the masses through the media. That's what we just read about in that book, or at least talked briefly about. Uh, that, that the media and the, and the music of the world is not no longer just to entertain. It's actually control. In fact, I read another article that said, uh, the music industry has given up the profit motive. In other words, that's to make money. And they have now adopted the control motive. That the goal is not just to make money. It's now to gain control over the masses. Because if you can control them, you can get their money. And you can get their everything else. <laughs> and you'll win in the end, according to the devil. Because all the world. And so it, to me, as I look going on, this is huge that is happening in the world around us. And has to be huge in my life one way or another, because 
all the world at the end of the time and all the world is headed in one direction and if we go along with the current, we will find perhaps ourselves at the very end of time along with all the world where we would not want to be. And it's a, a part of prophecy. You know, when, it talks, when we talk about music though, there's all sorts of different pre preferences and tastes and ideologies and beliefs and, and ways that you um, might interpret music and look at it and try to determine what is good. I mean, the, the variety of music out there today for anyone wanting to listen to is enormous. There's practically no end. And everybody has their personal pre preferences. And so whenever we start talking about music, we always get a little etchy. Yeah, edgy, you know, where it's like, oh, you're going to step on my toes, or, oh, you know, because we have these personal preferences. And I'm not going to spend a lot of time in this little bit talking about personal preferences and how to judge that. That's really part of another seminar. Um, what I want to talk about specifically is corporate worship service, because there's something that we experience. You know, when you go through potluck at church, there's a lot of variety to choose from. And this has to do with taste. Music we often refer to as in, in analogy terms of, of taste and eating, right? Because you have preferences or taste of music. And here when you go through like, you, you, the line in Pollock, you might have a lot of different tastes or convictions and ideas about music. I mean, about, uh, about what you want to eat. And you can choose. I'm not going to eat this and I don't eat that. And you can choose whatever you want. And usually, if, even if you have some allergy, you can find enough to eat, can't you, at, at most potlucks? And even if you have convictions about not eating something, you can find enough other options probably to avoid dairy if you chose, and even if there was dairy, even if there was meat at some, and a lot of them might have meat, and you can go through and you can choose what you want, and you can come out the other side, and it's not a big issue, right? Because I can follow my personal convictions when it comes to potluck. Is that true? Now, perhaps think about sitting in worship service. What happens when you're sitting in worship service and you might have convictions about music? what is right or what is wrong or what you would prefer. Can you pick and choose? You experience whatever is there, right? And you have no say except to get up and go. Is that true? Can you see why in corporate worship service there's like a different category of maybe when it comes to almost every other, if, if you could eliminate all other avenues of choosing good and bad words, good and bad music, in corporate worship service, you could at least see that we ought to aim for something that might be more universal and more far less objectionable to the vast majority of people. Does that make sense to you? That there's a different, maybe a different category when it comes to corporate worship service than it might come with my own personal preferences and taste. Because... In, in and, and granted, I think that there's principles that would apply to both, but at least when we look at this aspect and this part of worship, we have to recognize that there, there, there should be something as far as guidelines and principles that, that would apply to here as the highest level versus other areas of our life. Does that make sense? I hope it does, because at least as I've considered it, I think that it, um, it, it, it does. Music forms a part of God's Worship in the courts above, and we should endeavor in our songs of praise to approach as nearly as possible to the harmony of the heavenly choirs. We're going to stop here this morning and pick up tonight, um, looking at um, a little bit more on how is it in corporate worship service, what guidelines do, should we use that may be more so than we might even choose in our own personal preference, although we should consider why they are chosen maybe and how they impact us because from our message this morning we should take away a couple different points the first point is this music affects us and the music industry is trying to control us is that true it's everywhere and we are consuming more, and at the end of time, all the world is going to wander after the beast, and I can't personally but see that there's probably a connection between the two, because as I travel around the world, music has become universal. It used to be that there was, I mean, it used to be you went to Africa, and it was mostly a certain type of music, went to India, and it was mostly a certain type of music, went to China, and it was mostly a certain type of music, but now it's a universal language everywhere, it has the same basic beat, technology, emphasis, sound. I mean, there's still those components of other groups, but as I've seen it, I was in other countries, and it's like, man, that sounds, that's just what they have in rock culture in America. It's the same. 
And this is a universal language. And the devil, as a master musician, is taking control of the minds of young people, specifically, but of everyone in this generation. And so we have to look at music and say, this is a huge issue. That if we just say back and, and sit on our, on our experience and say, this is what I like or don't like, and use that as the criteria, we're gonna find that somewhere we're gonna miss out. And it might be too late when we find out we did. So we have to consider this as a huge issue in our life and look at it carefully. And study this for each one of us. Study it for myself and say, what is I going to use as the foundation and the criteria for my music, what I listen to? And then recognize, point number two, that music can take the place of this, even good godly music. That this is where the Christian has to find his hope and his strength and his courage. Taking and studying God's word and applying it to our hearts and lives for the throne of grace. Otherwise, we will miss out. And music can't take the place of this. It can't be a virtual experience with Christ. We have to have a personal experience with him in his word. And then thirdly, that corporate worship, corporate worship is a different class and a different category than any other perhaps type of place where we might listen to and enjoy or, or have music. And that we would have different standards maybe for that than we might for ourselves, although we would still need to consider what is the best for our own lives. Three points. Does that make sense from this morning's presentation? Okay, let's kneel for prayer. Father in heaven, please send us your spirit today as we go through recognizing that we are in the, in the middle of a battle between Christ and Satan and we are this great controversy that you and I are in, that each one of us are in, is being fought over our souls for the control of our minds and there is an effort. Well, it's happening maybe because it's marketing but it's still happening and the devil is, is, is taking over the control. We think we have freedoms to choose what we want to do and what we want to listen to and what we like and want to buy and what we actually believe and we don't know that we are being programmed. We are being controlled and the masses are losing true freedom of conscience and we're surrendering it, Father. It's our choices that are giving it up because we are absorbing and consuming what is being fed to us. We're eating it and our tastes are changing. And I pray, Father, that you would give us eyes to see and to consider in our own lives what your plan is for us in music and in media that we might be a part of that generation, rightly trained, an army of youth who will not be a part of those that all the world wanders after the beast. We pray, bless us to this end, bless our actions and our classes today. In Jesus' name, amen.